1945, Canadian author Hugh McLennan wrote a novel titled Two Solitudes. Since then, that title has been used to characterize the perceived lack of communication between French Canadians and English Canadians. Today, especially here in Montreal, the separate solitudes seem to have blended into one identity, more keen on moving forward than on clashing over language. I'm Richard Dagenet, and this is City Life. For three quarters of a century, it's been the go-to label. The reality of two solitudes has been blamed for everything from cultural misunderstandings to the sovereignty movement. But things seem to be changing. For one thing, Anglos have become much more bilingual. Back in 1971, only 37% of Anglos spoke both English and French. By 2006, that figure had shot up to 69.8%. Another big change has been in support for sovereignty. In 1979, shortly after the PQ was first elected, 63% of people between 18 and 34 supported separation. But in 2018, only 23% of people aged 18 to 24 are in favor. So are millennials changing the face of politics in our province? And has the time come for us to ditch the term to solitudes? City Life reporter Alexa Everett spoke to millennials on the streets of Montreal to find out if they think a generational change is underway. Frédéric Bérard is well versed in the subject of language relations. He remembers when the issue could get heated between neighbors. But he says his 17-year-old daughter hasn't run into those problems. It's much better today as it was uh, like even 15 years ago, right? I think that, that we achieved some sort of a peace, social peace about language issues. He still wants French to be the dénominateur commun and says the city's newfound peace doesn't change that. If anything, it helps. I think that, that those students, uh, as I said, merge much better together than, than, than we did in the past. But one of the reasons for that is that the Anglophones in Quebec, that generation, I mean, they learn French, they speak French, they like French. Uh, not saying that the, the Anglophones in the past did not like French, but they did not have the same relationship, right? While the language divide may be shrinking, Montreal millennials do see a split when it comes to culture. Anglophones in Canada and Montreal are more American than Canadian, and Francophones are, you know, like uh, Quebecers. Millennials' thoughts on Quebec's two solitudes seems to remain split, and many point to this as an improvement. Anglophones and Francophones would have different cultures, right? So from time to time, I feel like it would clash against each other and whatsoever. But I don't think we, like, they would dislike each other whatsoever. I don't believe there's a division, but I do believe that there's a difference. And that, like, sometimes you, um, you tend to approach people who would have the same culture as you. There are still some issues that tend to divide Anglos and Francos, like education. There's just a lot of separation between the two groups. I think it has mostly to do with the education system, where they streamline any French speaker or any immigrant into the French system, and English people try and hold on to their rights to go to English school. But speaking to millennials in Montreal, the tone seems to be a lot more about conciliation than confrontation. I understand French. Uh, yet I don't uh, speak it, but I don't think there's a, a division. Just in my workplace, in my school, sure those people who speak French and English, but they all manage to work together. It's not as if you have Francophones working on one side, English on the other. It's uh, like from my experience in Montreal, we've always found a way to just coexist and work together in a positive manner. There's a division, but I don't feel it because I'm bilingual. If you're bilingual, you don't really feel it as much. And it's that knowledge of the other language that many point out as the key to continuing to shrink the gap between the communities. If we overcome the language barrier, I'm pretty sure our cultures, of our, our communities will mesh a lot better. But right now, it's just a language barrier is so, is so relevant. It's, just, it's difficult to, to kind of fuse these groups. For now, Berard says some sort of divide between the city's Anglophones and Francophones is natural. But the term two solitudes may no longer be the expression used to describe the city's population. It's normal to have, you know, resemblance and want to, to get together with, with some of the people who speak your language. Perfectly normal. But as of today, I think that they switched 
French to English so easily and so often during the same day that for mo maybe not most of them, but some of them, I mean, they don't know if they're mostly Anglophone or Francophone right now because we have mixed marriage as well. Uh, so for me, I mean, that's, that's the best situation that we could achieve. Alexa Everett, City Life, Ville Marie. I'm joined now by Remy Fracker. He is a former political strategist in the U.S., which has got me curious, Remy. Um, how did you end up in Quebec? Well, I have family from here. Mm -hmm. my, my parents are from uh, a small town of Gramay next to Chamonix. And uh, my maternal language is, my mother tongue is French. So you learned French in the U.S.? Yes. Okay. There can't be many of you around? There's a handful that I know of that's excluding the uh, border areas, but um, under the age of 45 or 50, there's not many at all. Okay. So what state are we talking? Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, and what lured you up to Quebec? Um, just one, being able to speak French. Uh, being able to live my life uh, in the culture that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, I can identify with both, um, being very American and, a, uh, let's say, a New Englander, mm -hmm. and also um, the French culture that we grew up with from my family that moved from Quebec in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Had you sort of po uh, followed the politics of Quebec and uh, the social, the cultural uh, aspects of Quebec from down south? The the political side, yes, since the early 2000s, mm -hmm. and uh, culturally, um, for a while, our cultural references in terms of pop culture stopped in the mid-60s, and then they picked up again in the uh, late 90s. Okay, so when you came up here, you had a, an idea of what we were about? Yes. Yeah. So what did you observe when you first came up here, and what things would you say have changed since well, you've been up here? Well, to start with, it's, um, it's not what we're about. It's uh, it's sort of like coming home for me, but never having lived here, but also being new and not from here. So there are there is an acclimation. Mm -hmm. um, there's when I think of two solitudes, I think of um, the the terminology, the visit term terminology of uh, silos. And yes, that was very much the case um, from. Um, uh, the témoignages, uh, the, the uh, things that my relatives or friend, their friends, um, my relatives that still live here, had told me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's changed a lot. Um, uh, but there are still a lot of cases of the two solitudes in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is it is it more generation that is the reason there are still uh, cases of two solitudes? Would you say? I don't think completely. I think it's very much uh, based on those who, those who find themselves uh, uh, with anything related to public relations, marketing, communications, um, uh, very well aware of um, politics um, th that are very aware. But I have come across cases where there's a marketing manager that has always lived in Montreal or um, has lived in Montreal for a long, long time for years, and who doesn't know who Guy Alapage is or Marie May, uh, and they're used in a lot of commercials and advertisements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how would you say things have evolved, though, since you've been here linguistically in Montreal? Uh, almost all Anglophones I know are bilingual, or at least have a functional French. Um, I think that's beautiful because uh, it's, you're living, uh, it's, it's good to be aware of the other culture that you're living with. Mm -hmm. um, and most, most French people in Montreal are Fran uh, francophones. I think almost all that I know speak, speak a functional form of English. Mm -hmm. So everyone understands everybody else. Um, and do you feel that, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say that I, from what I've heard and been told um, and seen on footage, there's not um, as much it's, it's not even close to the friction that there was between communities um, as it was 30 to 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And is that, I mean, I, I would probably explain that by saying, yeah, the, I guess a shift in priorities from one, one generation to the next generation. I'm not sure if you would agree with that explanation. I think coming from the political side of things and also the uh, public relations um, aspect, there's a lot more people 
who are exposed, and I think the internet helps, uh, they're exposed to uh, different news outlets and also uh, that are aware of um, uh, musicians or artists from, from, well, say, the other side. Mm -hmm. But I, think, I still think there's a good uh, uh, minority percentage, a small percentage, that really have not much of a, of a clue what goes on in, on the other side. Mm -hmm. And how do we fix that? And what's the importance of fixing that? I think uh, education, um, maybe uh, uh, exchanging professors. Uh, this is uh, ideas that are thrown out there without uh, much backing and knowing how that would affect uh, school system. But I think uh, just exposure and finding different ways to get, uh, get getting both sides to be exposed. I think there's to each a, other. Yes, but I think uh, the francophones have a are a lot more aware of what, what's called the rest of Canada. Um, and uh, we'll just reference uh, uh, Tragically Hip or who else, is, uh, who else are big Canadians, English Canadians. Um, but English Canadians, I think the percentage is a lot, uh, it's, it's not close in terms of, it's still, it's still high. There's a lot, I think uh, the, the people the amount of Anglophones that are aware of public figures or issues on uh, the other side uh, mm -hmm. are is much higher than what it used to be, mm -hmm. but not as high as it should be. No, no. Yeah, and no, I think it's odd that um, I, a city like Providence um, that has 38, it's either 32.8 or 38.2 percent uh, Hispanic or or a Spanish-speaking population. Um, there's nobody there saying, greeting anybody by hi, hola, or um, there's, uh, I, I think there's, there's, there's a big, uh, that I think it's ironic that in the, any other, most other Canadian cities, that there isn't, there isn't, a, I think people talk to each other a lot more in Montreal. Yeah, given the, even considering that it's the second largest uh, French metropolitan in the world, mm. um, the capital uh, is not fully bilingual. Mm. But um, I think I think we're lucky because uh, being in Montreal, um, there's no. It's very unique. It's, I think it's most in many ways very the most unique uh, place in North America. Yeah. And yeah, for Montrealers who've grown up here, we know we're lucky. Yeah. yeah. Rémi Fanacker, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Merci. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at citylife at matv.ca. We're on Facebook at City Life Matv. And hashtag City Life Matv to reach us on Twitter. Here to talk about Two Solitudes is Iad Karad. He is a staff writer and photo editor at Le Daily, which is McGill University's only French language newspaper. And Legacy Dowson is a political commentator and Ethan Cox is editor at Ricochet Media. Thank you all for being here. And Ethan, let me start with you. As you live life in our city, uh, are you experiencing at all Two Solitudes? No, I don't think so. Um, I think we have one of the most remarkably bilingual and integrated cities anywhere, at least in my experience. Um, and I think that the linguistic tensions that were obviously heightened around the 1995 referendum and before that 1980 have, have, have calmed down a lot. And I think fundamentally we, we, we had our politics in this province for so long be on somewhat of a parallel track to the rest of the world where politics was divided based on whether you were a federalist or a sovereigntist as opposed to on a left-right division that we see in most places and I think what we've seen in the last number of years with the the appeal of sovereignty diminishing is a realignment of our politics back to a sort of more traditional left-right axis and I think those are the that's the basis on which we see the debates that unfold today uh, not on the basis of a sovereigntist camp and a federalist camp but a, a progressive and a reactionary camp mm -hmm. so that change Iad would you say that's a general generational thing? I don't think so. I think that today two solitude can be still experienced. Um, on this specific term of two solitude, I'd like to make a point. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think we, we always saw uh, has a duality, French, English, 
But I think that in 2019, we can say that there is literally a, a galaxy of solitude uh, in the sense that we always neglect um, indigenous people, indigenous language in this very, uh, in this very debate. And I'm talking about this because um, now, or last week, the, at the House of Commons, uh, there was this bill that has been passed or will be passed, um, which is the um, uh, Indigenous Language Act, who aims to um, include all indigenous languages as part of Canadian culture. culture. Um, that being said, I experience sometimes, uh, as a McGill student, um, a solitude. But I think, like, when we talk about two solitudes, what, what I see, and uh, what we all see, is um, a lack of communication. So for me, when there is lack of communication, what, what, would, what could be the answer for that, uh, which is bilingualism? And we, shall, we should be all proud because across Canada, uh, according to the last census of 2016, um, bilingualism is increasing uh, across, uh, across the country. So on an individual uh, level, for individuals, bilingualism is an asset. You can talk with each other. You can understand uh, realities of other people. But my point is, uh, from my perspective, um, institutional bilingualism can be detrimental for francophone culture. And how could I define institutional bilingualism? It's not only when uh, an, organi an organization operates in French or in English. It's mo much more an intangible um, uh, concept for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more a feeling. It's when you are evolving an environment, when you feel that bilingualism is taken for granted. In an, institu inst in an institutional setting? In its, yeah, it, or it can be an, an, an environment, uh, a room, or a school has McGill. Well, McGill is an anglophone institution, so mm -hmm. of course, uh, uh, we'll, like, we, we, think, we think that people will be able to speak in English nor in French. But if you want to add something, you can go. Uh, yeah, and so what do, you, what do you see, I mean, well, in terms I of what the I reality see, Among other things at McGill is that there are a fair number of francophones. Like, I think the number I've heard is one in five students. Yeah, 20% mm -hmm. of students are And from increasing from. numbers of faculty and administrators, too. So it's an anglophone institution, but with a very open attitude to francophones. And I think the same is, could be said of many other institutions, Francophone universities among them, although perhaps not to the same degree or depending on the institution. But in, in what I observe is that more and more Anglos are bilingual um, and uh, there's more usage, more crossing over the linguistic divide. There's much less, less of a malaise in the days when you'll remember the, the so-called angry phones and the Equality mm -hmm. Party and the victory of the PQ in the late 70s. I think most people are reconciled to Law 101 and uh, the necessity of learning school. There's the French at school. There's more and more immersion programs. I think sometimes it rears its ugly head. Every once in a while, you know, you don't. You might say something to somebody, like bonjour, hi, if you remember the mm -hmm. dispute yeah. around that. So you, you sometimes might rub people the wrong way. But generally speaking, I think that the tension has dropped. I agree with Ethan on that. Is that a generational thing? Do you think? I think it. I think to a large extent it is. I think the people who are resistant are the older generations on both sides of the linguistic divide. The older mm -hmm. francophones and the older anglophones, especially the older anglophones, I, I would say. But there are four million unilingual francophones in Quebec. That's a lot of people who only speak French. Uh, they're not all in the regions either. So many of them are in urban centers, and there are fewer and fewer unilingual anglos, just statistically, if you look at the numbers. So. It's a, it's a social experiment, a linguistic and cultural experiment that is largely successful, I would say. Most of us accept that our kids have to speak French. My kids are in immersion. What I, don't, what I find sometimes sad is that they speak the language, but they are not as fully knowledgeable as I would like of the culture, what's actually going on in the culture, who the main cultural figures are, the political figures. So I try and compensate for that by forcing them to watch and whatever, you know, like I, I make an effort to bring the devoir into the house and that kind of thing. Because I think linguistic competence is one thing, cultural knowledge is also critical. Mm -hmm. And cultural uh, knowledge would still qualify uh, under the heading of a, two, of a solitude, I guess. Yeah, to some extent. I think that's the last frontier of a fully integrated culture is that Francophones have to know a lot about Anglo culture because they are surrounded by it. Mm -hmm. We, the Anglos, need to know more, I think, generally, about Francophone culture, Francophone politics, 
certain susceptibilities that are important to understand. Things mm -hmm. like the headscarf issue, which is there's a clear linguistic divide on that, and there's reasons for that. And it's sometimes easier to understand it when you know a little bit more about the cultural background. Mm -hmm. You agree, Ethan? I do. I, I think to this question of a generational divide, it's a really interesting question because we're seeing around the world a huge generational divide. So when we look at climate change and income inequality, which right. are two of the, the biggest issues right now, the polling in the United States, in Europe, in, in Canada writ large, is very, very clear that there's a huge difference between young people and older people, particularly on climate change because young people are the ones that are most going to have to live with the, the, the consequences there, but also on you know stuff like do you support socialism versus capitalism, right? There's this huge generational divide. And in Quebec, we see that playing out in a really interesting way in the divide between the PQ and QS and the sovereigntist movement, that these are sort of two very different views of, of sovereignty and of Quebecois identity and nationhood, and it's very generational. The, the PQ's preoccupation with immigration, with immigration being a problem, with, uh, with members of minority religious communities and what they wear, this is stuff that plays really well to the 60 plus set in the regions, and it's stuff that is poison to young voters. And so that's what so much of, especially since the Charter of Values, so much of the growth of QS has been from young people saying, you know, maybe I'm a sovereigntist, but my primary preoccupation is in building a more just society, is in focusing on expanding social programs, on redistribution, on, on tackling income inequality, on tackling climate change seriously. And these are bigger priorities than the debates of, of my parents or my grandparents about language and, and being angry at each other constantly. So I think you know there is a generational divide around the world. And I think in Quebec, that plays out very clearly, where we see the emerging priorities of a younger generation that are are similar to but not the same as the generations that preceded them. Mm -hmm. And yet at McGill you say there's still instances of you're still experiencing two solitudes to some degree. Was yes. You know, well, my, at, at McGill, I, I think me. McGill does have like a policy on quality of French and use of French. Uh, for example, we can uh, give our homeworks or do our exam in French. Mm -hmm. I think it's well respected, but still in some classes this is not always uh, the case. Um, and just to come back at what he was saying, I think that there is uh, indeed a paradigm shift. I think that um, the ideal of independence now is maybe see more through um, a social ideals. So younger people could be interested in, inter in, in the, uh, through independence only if there is like uh, an idealistic view of society. And you talk about sociology in Quebec City Dial, they are, all, they are really, really pro promoting that. Um, my point, I want to, to make today, uh, um, we talk about uh, bilingualism, it, it's increasing and it's good. But for me, bilingualism nowadays still, still means English. Because um, uh, according to the census of, uh, made by uh, Statistic Canada, uh, bilingualism comes more by French people. The majority of bilingual people have French as their mother, mother, mother tongue, and I'll read, uh, in 2016, people with French as their mother tongue re represented 63.2 of the English French bilingual population in Canada. And on the so that's not just Quebec; it's it's Canada, all of Canada. No, it's it's it, this is it, what, this is is for Canada, and I also have the um, the Quebec uh, statistic. In Quebec, 60, um, 65 of the growth in the number of bilingual people is on account of the population with French as its mother tongue. So um, there is less uh, English people in Quebec, which, so, which, is, which is normal. But when we're talking about bilingualism now, nowadays, it still means that we're going to speak in English. It's asymmetrical. Not necessarily, but I think you're right. English is a very powerful international language. It's the language of business. It's the language of science. It's the language of research, increasingly. And it's, it's, it's crushing minority languages all over the world, including First Nations languages. But even in Europe, English is becoming, you know, it's, there's a, I even have a book on my bookshelf called Globish, which describes the sort of hegemony of English around the world. So th this is a constant struggle that we all have to wage, I think to defend our culture. Like even English Canadians need to dis defend their culture from the hegemony or the overwhelming amount of stuff coming over the border from the United States. So 
I think it's true that English does tend to dominate. But if you're aware of it in the context of Quebec, I've seen lots of cases of two Anglophones speaking French to each other in social situations oh, just, because they're possible. aware that French is the dominant language and so they make an effort. Like I, I think it's huge progress on many fronts, Things, incidents oh, like that. Please. Do we throw out the term two solitudes and or are there still you know solitudes of Quebec versus the rest of Canada or? I think it's a work in progress I and, I th and I think uh, your point about the galaxies of, That's anyway, of solitudes, I think we need to be doing more about protecting minority cultures and languages, especially First Nations cultures. And I think we also have to just be aware that you need to reach out, you need to be open to these outside cultures and you need to be open to the dominant culture in the case of Anglo-Quebecers to the, the importance and the incredible gift which is the French language and culture that we're surrounded mm -hmm. with. And I think at this point, when it comes to two solitudes, uh, the distinction between Montreal and the rest of Quebec is, I think, greater than between Anglophones and Francophones in Montreal. When you look at issues, for instance, you know, religious accommodation, there's just a gulf, a chasm between what people in Montreal think, whether they're Anglophone or Francophone, and what people in a lot of the rest of Quebec think. So I think that's a, a more meaningful division at this point. I think as Anglophones, a lot of the the problem when we talk about angry phones that we all remember fondly, um, a lot of the motivation for that angry phone thinking was saying there's English and French in Quebec and they need to be treated equally. And the problem with that thinking is it doesn't recognize what Anne is getting at, which is that we are a tiny French island in a sea of English. We are overwhelmed by American cultural exports. And so as Anne's saying, that, that negatively impacts English Canadian culture as well as Francophone culture, but it's absolutely normal and understandable for Francophones to be preoccupied with preserving French in that context. It's not Europe. It's not a context where English and French are on, on an equal footing. And if French is not actively protected when it is surrounded mm -hmm. by English mm -hmm. then it will go away and people will start just speaking English because that's easier it's easier to do business with people in Ontario in the United States where have you so you know I think Anglophones in Quebec nowadays have a much stronger understanding of that and why it's important to protect French I don't think many of the Anglophones that I know socially would argue at this point with protecting French mm -hmm. and, and the importance of doing that. I think they might quibble with the means of doing it, but I think that the fact of the importance of protecting f the French language and keeping it as the dominant language in Quebec is something that Anglophones have assimilated. Ethan, Anne, Yed, thank you very much for speaking with us today about this. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can. CityLife at mattv.ca. You can watch our shows online anytime at mattv.ca. I'm Richard Dagenet. Take it easy, Montreal. <laughs>